In Nigeria, people shot dead by police and hundreds arrested for protesting against government economic policies. President Tinubu says the reforms are vital. Critics say they're too extreme. So why are people so angry? And could this unrest spread? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Mohammed Jamjoum. Demonstrators shot dead and millions of people under curfew following days of protest against the government in Nigeria. Economic measures brought in by President Bola Tinubu's government have angered people across the country. Ministers say they're vital for Nigeria's future stability. But opponents say they're a form of shock therapy that are driving more people into poverty and desperation while having less impact on the rich and better paid, including government officials. So... How will President Tinubu respond to this unrest? And coming shortly after demonstrations and a violent crackdown in Kenya, could it have a wider impact on the region? We'll discuss all this with our guests shortly, but first, this report from Victoria Gatenby. Anger and frustration at the high cost of living in Nigeria, a feeling shared by many across the country. Protesters are demanding broad economic, political and social reforms. In Abuja, police fired tear gas at demonstrators. I came out to protest for plenty of reasons. Hunger, um, our, the purchasing power of my salary has been completely eroded. I know what my salary could purchase years ago, but now it's not the same. President Bola Tinubu scrapped fuel subsidies and devalued Nigeria's currency shortly after taking office in May last year. The Nira, pegged for years at an artificially high level against the dollar, has fallen by 70% since then. Tanubu's aim was to trigger an influx of foreign investment. But the short-term effect has been to send inflation surging to a nearly 30-year high, leading to a cost-of-living crisis that could undermine stability in Africa's most populous country. We are not going to stop until every Nigerian can live comfortably in Nigeria. We are not going to stop until we in Nigeria, we Nigerians living in Nigeria, enjoy similar life or a better life than even Niger countries across the world who don't have half of the resources that we have. Nigeria is one of Africa's largest oil producers, but its economy has stagnated for years. Corruption is endemic, many state institutions are dysfunctional, and insecurity caused by criminal gangs and also Boko Haram in the north has driven many people from their homes. The World Bank says around 40% of Nigeria's population of more than 200 million people live in poverty, and the higher cost of living has added to their numbers. Protesting against widespread hunger in the country, widespread inequality, poverty in the country. We are also, pro also protesting against issues around insecurity in the country because there's a lot of insecurity in the country, kidnappings. The government used nearly 70% of the revenue it collected in the first half of this year to service the national debt. It's an increase on past years but doesn't leave much money for anything else. Analysts warn the economy could suffer long-term damage if the protests continue. But demonstrators insist they'll remain on the streets until the government agrees to their demands. Victoria Gatenby, Al Jazeera for Inside Story. All right, we'll be getting the discussion with our guests underway shortly. But first, we're going to speak with a member of the Nigerian government. Mohamed Idris, Minister of Information and National Orientation. Thank you so much for joining us today on Inside Story. Minister Idris, let me ask you first. Amnesty International says that 13 peaceful protesters were killed by security personnel across the country, and they condemn that. What's the government's response to that? Well, uh, first and foremost, government has been making uh, this consistent uh, remark that once this kind of protests are allowed to happen, the likelihood is that uh, it can turn to riots. Um, many people that went on the streets on that day, on that fateful Thursday morning, was uh, you know largely peaceful in the early hours. So police, you know, accompanied these uh, uh, these protesters, uh, making sure that everything was going right. Before, like I said, many people now turned into uh, turned the situation into some some rioting, and and that is unacceptable. And so the the, the Amnesty International report is it didn't indicate also that. 
The police didn't just go about shooting people. The, 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 the protesters went on the streets. They started uh, burning vehicles. They started looting shops. They started, uh, you know, touching vehicles. It's impossible for the security agents to sit by and just allow these things to happen. And so it is actually the rioters who actually made this thing violent. The government and the police forces, the security forces, were making sure that everything was orderly. But you recall that before that time, we have always warned that the, the protesters can shove this plan because our history has shown that once you begin to go on the streets, the likelihood is that criminal gangs, criminal elements, can go on the streets and turn in this into violence. We have seen that over and over happen in this country. And that is why we insisted as a government that there was no need for this protest. Government has heard their voices. They've heard the demands of the protesters before that day. Recall that they've given so many days or weeks before this, this day came about. So mm. we're consistent in our messaging. Please shall be. Government is, is listening to you. Already reforms have been undertaken by the president, by this administration, to ensure that the very demands that uh, these protesters were putting out were already mm. being addressed. The economy has been a bad, very bad situation before the administration came into being. I recall that, uh, you know, uh, there was no, no, no budgetary provision was made as at June of last year when the administration came in. The administration came in on May 29th. Last year, there was no pro budgetary provision for... Uh, for, for fuel subsidy. It Minister has to Idris, go. Then there, let, there was, I'm yes. sorry to interrupt you, but let me ask you, since you're talking about the budget, uh, critics of the fuel subsidy removal say that enacting it when President Tanubu did, that that was too much and that it was too soon. Uh, they say that it was too much of a shock to the system. What do you say to those Nigerians who are grappling with unprecedented economic hardship? We knew that uh, there were going to be these uh, pockets of hardship, there were going to be challenges. I mean, Nigeria's economic situation has been a very bad one. Uh, it is not as if uh, the, economy turned, the economy turned by because President Bola Ahmed Tinubu took office. The indices are there for everyone to see who are borrowing uh, to sustain some of these subsidy uh, 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 funds that were required to, put, to continue to put it afloat. And so the president felt that this was unnecessary. We can't continue to live on fake life. It is necessary that go, uh, the administration goes back. Nigeria goes back to restructure its own economic uh, environment, mm. readdress the issues. Some of the questions are likely to be very painful. And that was why government came about with a lot of measures to cushion the effect. We knew that there were challenges and government never shied away from that. And so many other issues were put out there to ensure that whatever situation was there, at least Nigerians will have some kind of uh, relief in the in the medium and long term. But mm -hmm. for now, everyone has to press up because the economy has been bad. It has been bad over the years, so many years of neglect, uh, missed policies and uh, policies that were not really targeted at economic reform were being put out there. So it is important and imperative for the administration of President Bola Ahmed to ensure that these things were being put back. Now, to, to, to riot us, Minister Idris, the let, let me ask you this. There. Yeah. Uh, wh what is the level of concern right now uh, in the government that these protests are only going to grow? And, and is the president willing to make any concessions going forward? Well, government will continue to make whatever is possible to ensure that the citizens uh, get it right. Um, it, we have always said that the, list, the, the, president, the presidency of uh, President Bola Ahmed Chinubu is a listening one, unprecedented. Many are times when, the, when the policies are made, and, you know, Nigerians uh, uh, are not happy with it. Government always comes back to look at those policies and make amends. Government is there to protect lives and property to ensure that there are economic reforms. The labor uh, issue is an example. Um, when in, in October of last year, mm. uh, there was a wage award uh, issued by government of 25,000 Naira. When labor came and said the 25,000 Naira was too small, we had a debate with them, and at the end of the day, uh, additional 10,000 Naira was put out there. Look at also what happened. Uh, you know, the tripartite committee that was set up to look at the uh, new national minimum wage came about with a figure of about 68,000 Naira. Come and looked at it again. The president consulted uh, wider, and uh, at the end of the day, that was about uh, 8,000 Naira addition, making it 70,000 as the new national minimum wage. The National Labor Congress uh, was there. It was not what they wanted, but uh, of course, uh, uh, you know, they, they also accepted it, and, and we moved. We move. We, you know, we moved from it. And I want to say something. At the beginning of all this, uh, these protesters, uh, protesters didn't really come forward in person. Largely, what we are seeing was on the internet. Uh, you know, uh, on the social media, uh, saying that uh, the people were going to protest, and we're very concerned because if you don't have uh, the right leadership, if you don't have 
leaders that you can talk to mm. at the very beginning. And that's where the police and the other security agencies ask these uh, leaders to come forward. Of course, some of them did come forward toward the end, uh, mm. but largely the protesters were, 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 were faceless. The leadership was faceless. And that was the concern we have always shared. Protest is part of democracy. We are running a, a, you know, a democratic system. The president himself believes that uh, people and citizens have the right to protest whenever they feel aggrieved or when mm. they feel that policies are not going uh, in the right direction. But the fear has always been that this protest could turn to riots. And that's exactly what has happened. The protest right. turned to riots in many parts of it. And that is the concern that we all share. All right. Mohamed Idris, Minister of Information and National Orientation in Nigeria, thanks so much for joining us today on Inside Story. All right, let's go ahead and bring in our other guest from Abuja. Issa Sanusi is director of Amnesty International Nigeria. From London is Aisha Osori, director of Open Society Foundations, Ideas, and Fellowship Collaborative. And also joining us from Abuja is Kabir Adamu, managing director of Beacon Security and Intelligence and Consultancy. Thanks so much for joining us today on Inside Story. Issa, let me start with you today. You heard the minister's response to the reporting from Amnesty International. What do you have to say about the situation as it stands now? Well, um, it is so important that lives were lost. And uh, even before the protest, we have warned that uh, the security agencies must do their job, which is to make to provide protection for the protesters and make sure that hoodlums and other uh, elements uh, did not infiltrate this protest. And unfortunately, that happened. Uh, miscreants and uh, people who have bad intentions infiltrated this uh, uh, protest and caused a lot of chaos. But that does not defeat the fact that uh, Nigerians are hungry, Nigerians are angry, and they want to see the government doing the right thing. People are tired of years of corruption and mismanagement, and people are tired of being told stories about making sacrifice uh, to enjoy in the future. Uh, people are continuously seeing inequality increasing, their living standard deteriorating, and they came to the street. And we believe that as an organization, Amnesty International, we believe that people have the right to peacefully come onto the street express their views, agree or disagree with the government, and go mm. home peacefully. And that is what Nigerian government is finding difficult to, uh, to accept. Aisha, talk our viewers through why there is so much anger right now in Nigeria, why so many people are taking to the streets. Um, what are some of the other underlying issues that are contributing to all of this? Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I mean. Aside from the cost of living crisis, which makes uh, we have food inflation of 40 percent right now and rising, aside from that, there's just also the sense that we've been badly managed for the last couple of decades. And yes, the minister is right that maybe this situation didn't start with uh, the Tinubu administration, but they are part of the previous administration. There are at least six people in Tinubu's cabinet that also served with the previous Buhari administration. So people are unhappy because as the minister said, there is a lot of pain with the new policies around removal of oil subsidy, around subsidy, removal of subsidies on electricity. But what the minister didn't say was that the pain is only being felt by the citizens. We're not seeing any balance of this pain with any sacrifices being made on the side of the executive, the judiciary, or the legislature. Instead, what we're actually seeing is an increase in the type of uh, unnecessary spending that we see on parts of government. And that's also what's creating this anger with citizens. Mm. They're saying, we can't afford the basics. We can't afford gari, which is a form of cassava that's usually considered the food that everyone can access. People can no longer eat that, but we can still afford a private jet, a new private jet for the, for the president. Mm. We can still afford a, a lavish residents for the vice president. So these are the things that are causing that anger. So Nigerians are not unreasonable. We have a long history of protest, even under monarchies before we were colonized by the British. So mm -hmm. people know that one way to hold uh, people in leadership accountable is to protest. What we're not seeing from our governments from decades is that understanding that citizens have this need and right to protest is the commensurate balance in ensuring that when citizens come out to protest, they are indeed safe. What we see, if the minister is right that they were anticipating violence, then what they should have done is been more proactive about mm. ensuring that the destruction of property that we saw 
was didn't happen. And you can actually deal with protesters without shooting them. I mean, you can handcuff them, you can immobilize them with tasers. You don't have to use live mm. bullets to kill people. So I, I didn't buy these excuses from, from the minister. I see where he's coming from, but he's not being honest about the reasons why the violence is happening and the government's response to this violence. Uh, Kabir, um, I want to talk to you about something that Aisha was mentioning there, which is this issue of the removal of the fuel subsidy. It's caused so much anger in Nigeria um, because it's really taken a bite out of the disposable income of so many in Nigeria. Uh, there are experts who say that the removal of the subsidy will actually and ultimately have a positive effect on Nigeria's economy. And then there are those who say that doing it in the way that it was done, it was just too much and it was too soon. It was a shock to the system. What do you say? What is the actual case here going forward? Um, so, I mean, the irony is that Nigeria is an oil producing country. Uh, in fact, the biggest in Africa. Um, and so it's, it's quite, um, um, you know, a, a surprise that in spite of all of that, Nigeria has to import uh, refined petroleum. Now, that's where the whole issue comes in, to import that refined petro petroleum and to have it available to citizens at a price they can afford. Uh, what has happened in the past is the government would subsidize that imported oil. Um, all the refineries that exist in Nigeria are not uh, operational at the moment. And so it pays that subsidy. And um, of course, the corruption around both the importation and then the selling of, of um, the refined petroleum has now meant that the subsidy itself has been increasing over the years. And so I think there's a general realization by most Nigerians that um, the subsidy sh should be removed. But then it is, in, I think, in the manner that it was removed. And then, unfortunately, in spite of the removal, um, all the benefits that were promised uh, sur surrounding the removal, as, as an example at the moment, in spite of the removal, um, petroleum is not available in most um, foil stations, in, in, in especially the big cities in Nigeria. And then even where it's available, the price um, is beyond uh, what the average Nigerian can, can afford. Now, if you look at the ripple effect that petro the cost of petroleum has on virtually everything from transportation to healthcare mm. to food. Um, so that's uh, kind of where the anger comes from. Uh, did the government take into consideration the consequences of that removal and then uh, go ahead to put in mm -hmm. place palliatives to reduce the impact of the citizen? Unfortunately, no. Issa, um, we've seen these protests in Nigeria follow similar recent demonstrations that swept other African countries, including Kenya and Uganda. Were the protesters in Nigeria inspired by these other protest movements? And do you think that these protests will, will just spread? Well, um, uh, definitely the world is aware of what happened in Kenya, Uganda. But, but actually, the protests in Nigeria started in February this year, earlier in the year. It did not start before that of Kenya. Uh, women organized a protest against hardship in the month of February this year. Uh, in Mina, Niger State, uh, women organized a protest against hunger in the same month in Kano in northern Nigeria. Therefore, it did not get inspiration from anything apart from hardship, suffering, a high cost of living, corruption, perception of neglect of the basics. You cannot, you cannot continue to live in this kind of situation and expect people to keep quiet. So what is expected of Nigerians uh, or Nigerian authorities is to prioritize improving the living standard of the people and to reduce doing things that will create the perception that they don't care and Nigerians are not deserving of better life. And therefore, it is hardship, it is hunger, it is unprecedented inflation that inspired Nigerians, but not Kenya, not Uganda. We have our problems and we are responding to them appropriately. Aisha, I was in Abuja in February 2023 reporting on the elections, and I spoke to a lot of youth activists at that time who were hopeful that perhaps they would be able to move the needle in those elections. Um, one of the things I kept hearing from younger Nigerians is how difficult the situation is for students throughout Nigeria. Um, and I want to, to talk to you about that. How challenging 
are the circumstances for them when it comes to buying textbooks, when it comes to paying school fees? Well, it's extremely difficult for students and their parents, because I guess in Nigeria, uh, parents are the ones who tend to uh, foot the bill for, for students. And in acknowledgement of how difficult it's been, obviously transport raises the cost of living, uh, schools, lack of electricity, all the tariffs on electricity also make schools uh, have to pay more uh, to provide the service and they pass on those costs to students. So extremely, extremely difficult. And again, this has been decades in the making. We, we, we continue to acknowledge that. And I think that's part of the frustration. So yes, very, very difficult for students. And this is why I think to a certain extent, the government, this government, uh, Tinubu's government, when he came in last year, introduced some sort of loan for students. Um, to be honest, not very clear how that's working, what the perception is about how well uh, that program is going. Uh, but it's early days yet. But Students have generally also been the conscience of Nigeria when it comes to protests. We've had very active student unions who used to protest everything from apartheid in, in South Africa to corruption in, in our oil industry. So we have a very vibrant history of students protesting, and this is no different. I would say, though, that I think that part of the reason why um, students are having things so hard is because, again, we have it's the structure. Of, of Nigeria's political economy, one has to ask themselves, why do we have so many federal schools? Why does the government have so many universities as opposed to having a handful that are well equipped, fully funded, um, so that you have less vice chancellors? So what I see mm. in Nigeria and why students are not, unfortunately, the only ones who are suffering this is because we have structural issues. We're an extractive state that likes big government. You can you, you can see that in Tinubu's cabinet of 45 mm. ministers. But ideally, he could have a cabinet of 36. So we like big governments. And it, I think it, it is one of the demands of, of this protest. It is a long menu of, mm -hmm. of demands, but definitely um, declaring a state of emergency in education and health is mm. definitely on the list of because students realize that there's a connection between... Aisha, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry yes. to interrupt. It's just that we're starting to run out of time. Um, I, I want to, yeah. to, to ask Kabir a, a question uh, that would need for us to sort of zoom out a, a little bit here. Um, the economic situation that Nigerians are facing, is this unique to Nigeria or is it something that others in the region are going through as well? Um, I, I, I think um, it's not unique to Nigeria. Other uh, other countries, uh, as an example, Ghana is going through the same challenge, uh, the cost of living crisis. And there were indicators uh, to suggest that similar protests were also being organized uh, there. Um, and of course, almost across the region, um, so many factors have come together to create uh, this cost of living uh, cri uh, crisis, as it were, uh, environmental factors, um, social factors, political factors, and then um, the security element. Uh, why I think that of Nigeria has become so manifest is that the factors are coming together at the same time. And then unfortunately, I think um, just like the minister uh, did, uh, most government officials are not validating the gen genuineness of the circumstances that Nigerians are going through, just like the two other speakers have mentioned. Um, mm -hmm. If you break it down, uh, affordability of basic food items, essential items, is almost out of reach for most Nigerians. And that's the really reality. And I want to um, 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 emphasize this point. The Tinubu administration has put forward several policies in an attempt to uh, reduce the consequences of this. The sad part is mm. that those policies are not being felt by, by Nigerians. And so that's why you are seeing the anger that you're seeing at the moment. Issa, I, I want to get your sense on where all this might be headed. Uh, do you think that the government will start engaging in more dialogue with the protesters? Um, and also, what steps could the government take immediately to calm the situation? Well, I believe that uh, one of the first steps that the government has to take in order to calm the situation is to do the right thing. And the right thing is allowing Nigerians to assemble peacefully express themselves and go back home. Uh, protesters should not be seen as the enemies. And uh, when people criticize the government, they are supposed to be listened to. And uh, the way forward, 
definitely is for government to start doing something concrete. Um, I remember that one government official, uh, you know, about a year ago, he said that in nine months, Nigerians will be happy, everything will change. And people on social media were, were taking him to account yesterday and saying, well, nine months ago, you said we will be happy. And we are now saying in the next nine months, again, we will be happy. So they have to build that kind of confidence. They have to do the right thing. And people have to see commitment on the part of their leaders to making life easier for them. Uh, resources belonging to the public should be made for the good of the public, not for the enjoyment of a few people. And that is what is generating the anger. You mm. find families struggling to feed, and you find a few people living lavishly on government funds. And that is what is generating the anger. Mm. Even, even people in the middle class are subject of scorn of these people that are suffering. And therefore, to save our country, our leaders and everyone must do the right thing because mm. um, Isa, the next I'm, thing will not be good. Isa, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but we're just about to run out of time. And I, I just want to ask Aisha a, a final question. We only have about a minute and a half left, Aisha. Um, if the perception going forward is that the concerns of the protesters aren't being taken into account, uh, and if they believe that a crackdown on constitutional freedoms is playing out, where do you see this going? Well, I see that we will continue to see pockets of protest. It's not clear how long this will last. The protesters say they're going to stay on the streets till August 10th. I think that gives the government enough time to do, as Issa says, protect the protesters, arrest the looters, keep protesters safe. And I think Tinubu needs to address the nation and there needs to be very clear optics. This is no longer about relying on perception and promises. We need to see this. Protesters need optics of seeing how government is feeling the pain of these policies that they claim are going to yield benefits in the future. Most Nigerians are feeling the pain now. They want to see that people in government are also feeling the pain because we have a history of people in government always getting more out of the state than regular people. And I think that's what's going to make the difference. So address uh, protesters and make some sacrifices immediately and keep protesters safe. All right. Well, we have run out of time, so we're going to have to leave the conversation there. Thanks so much to all of our guests, Issa Sanusi, Aisha Osori, Kabir Adamu, and Minister Mohammed Idris. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on X. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Mohammed Jamjoum, and the whole team here, bye for now. Make sure to subscribe to our channel to get the latest news from Al Jazeera.